Hello and welcome to Mr. Crowder's World. This podcast asks and answers the question, why do we think we know how old really old things are? This is a very good question and a tough one to answer, since humans only live at most a century and usually only half that. Our Gregorian calendar only goes back about 2,000 years, yet we say the Earth is 5 billion years old. It doesn't seem like we've been around long enough to make such a claim. Why do we think we know that mankind only reaches back into history about 50,000 years? Or perhaps more than tripling this figure, the recent human fossil find in Ethiopia by geologist Richard Leakey and his team of paleontologists who traveled in 1967 to the Kibish Formation along the Omo River and later in 2001 by Frank Brown, Dean of Mines and Earth Sciences at the University of Utah. Brown and his colleagues determined that these fossilized bones of Homo sapiens were 195,000 years old, the oldest fossils of our human species ever found. On what methods could these rather exacting figures rattled off by scientists like the time for the extinction of the dinosaurs 65 million years ago or the age of the Earth be based, and why do we believe their accuracy? The dating of things older than recent history probably begins with tree rings. Since we know exactly how old a living tree is by its rings, then we can start there. The differing growth rate of a tree caused by the change of seasons creates its rings. When the tree's growth slows in the cooler winter weather, the ring being formed is darker due to the nutrients concentrating in the ring and not spreading out as much as they do in the warmer summer months. Thus, alternating bands of dark and light rings allows the observer to count the years of growth. The outer layer just under the bark, usually a green layer, is the one growing and it represents this year. The others below this outer layer are dead and no longer growing. Being a tree, for you, would be like your skin is all that's alive and everything underneath is just a framework for your skin to grow on. The assumption is that in the big rain years, all the trees in the same forest will have thick rings, though thick on one tree might be thinner on another, so it's relative to each tree's own particular growth rate, and in drought years, all of them are going to be thinner. We can accurately date wood back to about 20 to 50,000 years in some temperate forests with tree rings, thanks to Andrew Ellicott Douglas, who first formulated the tree ring method for dating known as dendrochronology in the early 1900s. Actually, Douglas was an astronomer, not an archaeologist, but he figured the change of solar energy would affect tree growth and that he might be able to extend the sunspot cycle, his focus of study, further back into history. Dendrochronology is the analysis and cross-comparison and tracking in extensive data collections, usually with short and long lines tabulated into vertical columns. The scientists can then overlap data, creating an unbroken chain, starting with the current year's outer ring, cross-referencing through more and more ancient trees, felled, fossilized, or cored with an instrument called an increment borer, all in the same forest. Obviously, forests in other parts of the world might have different weather systems for these same sampled years. So it's important to note that your cross-referencing to form a chain of known dates is only good for each particular forest, so tree ring data is not global. Since a sort of Morse code develops with patterns of drought and rain over decades and centuries, thick, thin, thick, 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 thin, thick, thin, 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 you can take data that overlaps from tree to log to petrified log to perhaps the dawn of man in some places. This is how the Anasazi ruins on the western Colorado Plateau were dated. Looking at the tree ring patterns in the wooden supports of buildings found under an outcropping of rock. Okay, fabulous. So we can date back to 50,000 years by cross-referencing tree ring patterns in a sample of wooden spoon, table, building, or artifact but how do we date ancient bones, rocks, or really old things like the age of the earth itself? Around the same time as Douglas's dendrochronology, discoveries were being made in radioactivity by Henri Bacquerel, Marie Curie, Ernest Rutherford, and Wilhelm Röntgen. Radioactivity is the steady loss of small particles flying out of the nucleus of atoms. Atoms found in nature are either stable or unstable. An atom is stable if the forces among the particles that make up the nucleus are balanced. An atom is unstable, the term more commonly used, radioactive, first coined by Marie Curie. 
if these nuclear forces are unbalanced, apparently because it has an excess of internal energy. An unstable nucleus will continually vibrate and contort, and sooner or later attempt to reach stability by some combination of ejecting neutrons and protons, converting one to the other with the ejection of a beta particle or a positron, or the release of additional energy by photon or gamma ray emission. As the unstable nucleus emits radiation or disintegrates, the radionuclide transforms itself into different nuclides. This process is called radioactive decay. It will continue until the forces in the nucleus are balanced. For example, as a radionuclide decays, it will become a different isotope of the same element if the number of neutrons changes, or into a different element altogether if the number of protons changes. So, this distinguished group of Nobel laureates were finding out things like radioisotopes or emitters were charged particles and that they would veer off their paths when coming in contact with a magnetic field, meaning they were particles and not waves, like X-rays, discovered by Rankin, and that they would make air become an electrical conductor by ionizing the air, this discovery by Baccarel. Since radiation ionized or gave a charge to air particles, then two electrodes held really close and almost touching would carry a charge across the gap of air, completing a circuit like a wire made of air. This concept is what eventually led to the Geiger counter, named after its inventor. Geiger realized he could carry around a battery-powered device that uses two electrodes mounted extremely close together, but not touching, to complete a circuit only when the air became ionized by radiation. The device then would make a beeping sound, flash some lights, or produce a digital readout, so the groundwork was being laid on how radioactive isotopes and elements behaved. By 1911, Charles Wilson had invented the cloud chamber. This would allow a person to actually see the trails of the radioactive particles, very similar to those trails left by a jet airplane flying so high in the atmosphere that the plane itself is invisible, but the contrail or vaporization trail made by its exhaust interacting with the particles in the air is easily recognizable. The same thing happens with radioactive particles. Yes, they're super tiny atomic sized particles, completely invisible to even a microscope, but their paths can be revealed by a cloud of condensation left behind by ionization or charging of the atoms in cool, humid air. This caused by quickly moving radioactive particles emitted from a radioisotope. There are many forms of these radioactive particles. Some are the size of helium nuclei and some are massless. The Greek letters alpha, beta, and gamma are a few of their names. During this early flurry of discoveries, Frederick Soddy and Ernest Rutherford in 1903 came up with the law of radioactivity. It seems that all radioactive isotopes, called parents, decay at the same rate into their particular daughter elements. The daughters are whatever the parents have become once they've decayed. Now that doesn't mean that all elements have the same decay rate or speed of radioactivating, but that each radioactive element decays at its own particular rate forever, or until all of the atoms are done radioactivating, once that particular element's rate of decay has been established on a graph. Now how do we know that? How can they be so sure this is the case for every element, and that there is no end to the decay, and what is so important about this graph anyway? Soddy and Rutherford would establish a rate for whatever element they found by using a counting mechanism like Wilson's cloud chamber or the Geiger counter, and the element in every sample would always continue decaying at this same rate for as long as they measured it. Also, each element was found to have its own unique rate of decay. For some, the decay rate slowed to half in less than a millionth of a second, and some apparently would decay into the tens of billions of years before their rate slowed to half speed. Rubidium-87, for example, is said to take 40 billion years before it finally slows to half. They don't know that. How could they? No one has ever lived that long. This figure is extrapolated from a graph, which is the exact same graph for every radioactive element. The only difference being the increments of time you use on the graph's x-axis. That's the other part of the law. Every radioactive element uses the same decay graph, just with different numbers of time on the x-axis. Interestingly enough, it's the same graph used for the odds of flipping coins. In light coins, we feel the more items there are to flip, in this case the atoms, 